All right. So, hi everyone. Welcome to my talk today. I am thrilled to be able to virtually join you and to have this opportunity to present my research before you. The title of my today's talk is uh, Designing for Voice, Access, Autonomy, and Justification Questions in Designing Computing Technologies with Marginalized Communities. Before starting my talk, here is a brief introduction of myself. Um, my name is Said Ishtiak Ahmed. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto. I earned my PhD at Cornell University in 2018 and master's in 2014, and I'm a Bangladeshi citizen. I was born and raised in Bangladesh, and before coming to North America, I did my bachelor and master's in computer science from Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. So now I'd like to share with you the background of my research. I grew up in Bangladesh in 1990s. So while growing up, I found many computing technologies were coming into the country, desktop computers, mobile phones, dial-up internet, among others. And this continued even in early 2000, when we saw technologies like broadband internet, smartphones, tablet computers, smart watches, social media, sharing economy applications, they kept coming to the country. I saw that these technologies were bringing several notable changes to the lives of the local people in Bangladesh. So I kept asking to myself this question, if those changes were actually desired by the local communities or they were imposed on them. More often than not, I found the computer technologies were not addressing the main challenges that the local people had in their lives. So when I grew up, I set my goal to understand the needs of these underserved populations and work with them to improve the quality of their life. With this in mind, I developed the first ever human computer interaction research group in Bangladesh in 2009 with some bright undergraduate students in Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. In the last 12 years with this group and other collaborators, I have studied different marginalized communities in Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, and Canada. And I documented their problems and designed technologies with them. These communities include ready-made garments workers, taxi drivers, evicted slum dwellers, mobile phone repairers, and victims of sexual harassment, among others. While conducting my research with these communities, first I try to understand their challenges in these people's lives by studying their culture, politics, economy, and history. Then I build computing technologies with them that are accessible, inclusive, robust, and low cost. So my research methodology is actually a combination of ethnography and computing. With these research methods, I try to address the central theme of my research, which is voice. So let me first explain to you what I mean by voice and why is voice important for marginalized communities. To answer these questions, let us think about the world that we live in. We often call this world the world of data and information. For many of us, we get information when we open a newspaper or turn on television, radio, or switch to social media. All of these sources can be thought as platforms of voice, where we learn about the stories and opinions of various communities. These and other similar platforms are also often used for harvesting data, and we, the computer scientists, often use those data for developing computational models. However, how many of us have ever thought that these platforms do not represent the actual data information, opinions, and thoughts of various marginalized groups? For example, it is almost impossible to find the thoughts of millions of illiterate people on these platforms because they either do not read and write or they do not use the digital technologies. Similarly, we won't hear the voice of millions of victims of sexual harassment on these platforms because talking about sex is often stigmatized in many communities. Then millions of factory workers around the world don't feel safe to share their thoughts because the fear of losing their jobs. Similarly, millions of refugees do not freely participate on these platforms because their identities are not secure and protected. Thus, our digital platforms and other methods of collecting data lack the representation of this and many such marginalized groups. Or in other words, as I say, we lack their voice in our computing systems. Now, I define voice as a comprehensive socio-technical process for these communities for obtaining freedom. This voice is not only a final product for me, but also the entire process that gives a community the necessary freedom to stand for their concerns. 
my research tries to understand where, when, and how this process of voice is hampered, stopped, and people are silenced, and how we can design socio-technical arrangement with the communities to overcome these challenges. This objective frequently leads me to various relevant research questions related to voice. For example, how can technology be accessible to all? How can we achieve social freedom over a technology? How can we make an infrastructure inclusive and sustainable? Or how can we make people's voice heard? And these are just only a few of the questions that I explore. So I have been addressing these questions of access, autonomy, and justification in my research for the last 12 years. In today's talk, I'll briefly describe my projects on access and autonomy, and then focus on uh, more recent projects on justification. So when I started talking about voice and thinking about voice, the first thought that I had in my mind was that one in every five people in the world cannot read and write. And there are many others who are semi-literate, and there are many who are digitally illiterate. These and other major barriers, this is one of the major barriers for them to access the digital platforms and share their thoughts. I looked into the existing research on making computing technologies accessible to low literate populations, and I found that scholars had made great efforts by making the interfaces more accessible to the low literate users by adding graphics and audio interfaces. While each of these efforts made some success, they all failed after a certain limit because those interfaces demanded the low literate users to remember graphics or audio clues, which was not possible for them after a certain limit. I realized that most efforts in making the computing interfaces was either depending on the user's cognitive ability or the ability of the interface to help the user's cognition. However, my living experience in Bangladesh told me that the use of mobile phone is often shared in that part of the world and targeting a single user for the use of technology might not be appropriate for the local communities. Having this in my mind, I conducted a six month long ethnography with a group of illiterate rickshaw drivers in a garage in Kamrangichur area in Dhaka, Bangladesh in 2012. These rickshaw drivers are illiterate but they all were using mobile phones. So in this ethnography, my objective was to learn how they were able to use their phones and what are the challenges they might have in using this computing device. Soon I found that the rickshaw drivers would take help from their garage owner who was a literate person and was willing to help the drivers in using their phones. Soon I also found that some other such literal members in their communities were helping these illiterate rickshaw drivers. This model of help matched well with the gift giving theories in the classical anthropology, especially with the work of Marcel Moss. But there were challenges too. From our field work, we also learned that the illiterate drivers would struggle to use this gift when the helping hand were not around them. For example, at night when they were at home with their families and when they were away from their work uh, from their garage in the daytime. To address that problem, based on the gift giving theory of Marcel Moss and the lessons that we got from our field work, I co-designed a mobile phone application for the rickshaw drivers that would allow them to take help from their garage owner remotely. We used graph matching algorithm to find the most suitable matches and to distribute the load of helping. The implementation was based on text messages as the use of internet wasn't common within that community and because we wanted to keep the cost low. We deployed the prototype with 12 participants for six weeks as the pilot, and then with 60 participants for six months as a longitudinal study. In both cases, we found that the users found ease and comfort in using our system, and it contributed to making their community bond stronger. We reflected on our work on access in this project and took a few important lessons for the marginalized groups in the Global South. Number one, Modern computing design is often built on Western assumptions, which are not applicable in places outside the Western world. This lesson is aligned with the theory of post-colonial computing by Lily Irani, Davita Philip, and their colleagues. And number two, when we look at a problem from a Western perspective, we often miss the local resources like community bonds that can be very important and essential design resources for people in the global South. This lesson is aligned with the theory of asset-based design by Kintaro Toyama, Neha Kumar, and their colleagues. In summary, any design effort for helping access to con computing should be rooted in the local social context. However, only access is not enough. 
While it is important to make technologies accessible for all, it never ensures the voice of marginalized groups over computing platforms. We need something more. Many people have technical access to computing systems and they can read and write, but they are not free to express their thoughts. Despite having technical access to computing, their voice is startled by the society. This is why the next important step toward voice is freedom or autonomy. To explore the challenge with autonomy, I turn to the problem of sexual harassment in Bangladesh. Like most other countries in the world, sexual harassment is a serious problem in Bangladesh. Thousands of incidents of sexual harassment are reported each year to the police. However, as the social scientists found, most incidents of sexual harassment remain unreported. Especially women do not want to talk about this because this topic is stigmatized in the community. Many of these women are rich and educated. They have access to modern computing technologies and they know how to complain over social media. However, they often remain silent because of the overarching social pressure. I wanted to find the root of this silence. With a group of female researchers in Bangladesh, our team spent more than one year to conduct anonymous surveys, interviews, and focus group discussion with the women who suffered from sexual harassment. Several participants told us that almost all the women in Bangladesh have experiences of direct or indirect sexual harassment, but very few of them actually talk about it. And it was evident even in our data collection process. We could only conduct 11 interviews in the whole one year, even after advertising widely. Some women registered for the interview and then canceled the appointment. Some came but then decided not to talk. Some busted into tears in the middle of the interview and left. Some completed the interview and then called us and asked us to delete the interview. It was evident to our research team that the silence around sexual harassment was not easy for them to break. The few interviews and FGDs that we could finally complete gave us some important insights into this problem. For example, we could learn that the women wanted to help at the spot. They wanted to quickly reach out to their friends and families and the victims felt better when they could share their stories with others. However, the main problem that we found through our study was silence. Social stigma, fear, shame, and pain was silencing them. In response, we developed a mobile phone application that would allow women to report a sexual harassment, to ask for help at the store, and instantly reach out to their friends and families. We also developed a website where women could report the incidents that they experienced or observed we were visualizing the reports over a live map of the city. They would also share their thoughts in the form of a blog anonymously. We would share the reports and blogs over a Facebook page to create more awareness and invite dialogue. We call this system Protibadi, a Bangla word that means one who protests. We launched this system publicly in 2013. Soon after the launching, we started to get thousands of reports each day where women anonymously reported various kinds of harassment from inappropriate touch to cat call and from verbal abuse to serious forms of physical torture. This project was highlighted in many national and international news media outlets, including the BBC and the team scientists. However, at the same time, we also observed that the anonymous reports were attacked by many men and women on social media these people started to blame the victims. For example, the screenshot here shows an anonymous report by a woman who was catcalled on the street as she did not cover her head. She felt abused and reported about that on Protibadi. However, when the anonymous report was published, many men and women started to blame the victim, saying she was asking for it because she wasn't covering her head. Similar incidents started to happen frequently over Protibadi, and we saw a decline in reporting. At one point, the rate of reporting went down so low that we decided to close the system. This was an important lesson for me on how the voice of the marginalized groups like women is silenced by the society. I further noticed that the mechanism of this silence is, was ethics. For example, in this case, the crowd used a version of Islamic ethics to silence the victim. Similarly, in some other cases, I saw people were using Western neoliberal feminist ethics to blame women who chose a life of a homemaker. So I started asking these questions. Who determines what is right and what is wrong over a computing platform? How ethics can be used as a tool for silencing marginalized groups? And how can we strengthen the voice of the marginalized communities by establishing their ethics in and over computational platforms? 
This question allowed me to explore the growing scholarship within computer science around ethics and computing, more specifically ethics in AI. I found that the scholars in the Western world have been criticizing the modern computer science and its various applications for either purposefully supporting or for making the way for various analytical activities. Let us explore some of these concerns. Among various concerns of unethical use of computing systems, privacy breaching is a leading concern. Various AI algorithms and other computing applications are found to be capturing sensitive private information of the users and using them to gain profit. Even worse, in many cases, such data are used to manipulate people's political orientation. Among many, Sochana Zubov's book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, explains this problem in details and shows how private data often works as, as the fuel of data-driven capitalism. Another important concern that has been voiced by scholars in is the biases in computing systems, especially in the data-driven systems. The scholars like Ruha Benjamin and Virginia Evans have explained how various practices around data reflect the historical biases in the society, and hence data-driven systems are often biased against the marginalized groups. If we look deeper into these ethical concerns that have been voiced by these scholars, we see how they are rooted in some ethical standards that are commonly accepted in the West. Many of these concerns are underpinned by the faith in secularism, democracy, nationalism, liberalism, and free market economy, for example. As a result, the associated scholarship has been successful in determining problems with racism, sexism, ageism, ableism, colonialism, among others. However, there are many other ethical concerns that cannot be associated with computing and AI systems that have not surfaced through this process. For example, the caste system in India needs to be understood from the local history, philosophy, and ethics. Similarly, the concerns of many Muslims around the use of human-like robots needs to be understood from Islamic philosophy and associated ethics. Such ethical concerns are rarely voiced in the discourse of ethical computing, and I want to shed some light on this issue. Let us try to understand this issue better by two stories from Bangladesh. The first one is taken from a recent paper written by Christensen and his colleagues. They wrote about a weather prediction technology that they deployed in rural Bangladesh to help the farmers. Let me read a paragraph directly from the paper. The village mosque lies at the center of the village life, metaphorically as well as physically. It is the spiritual, moral, and religious epicenter of the village. Therefore, it was a blow to the project that the local imam, after consideration, disallowed NGO staffs use the mosque PS system as a means of, to broadcast messages. The local imam did not approve of the announcement of the messages, such as weather forecast and associated agricultural advice stemming from the service in his mosque. The reason given by the imam was theological, only Allah knows. The field officer assigned from the local NGO to the village comes every five days or so and was hoping to continue some messages and forecast to the villagers using the mosque. Select messages on, for example, extreme weather predictions such as doubt or flooding that may be considered important and even vital for the welfare of the village. And the NGO officer was hoping in the process to promote the service and the work of the NGO. A few messages were mic'd in the mosque to use the expression of the NGO officer before the practice was discontinued. Now, so as we can see here, the local community believes that only the God can predict the future and any attempt to do so by humans or technology is considered challenging the God and hence unethical according to their faith. The ethical concern of local villagers was coming from an ethical standpoint that is hardly taken seriously in ethics and AI on ethics and computing research. If we take to take it further deeper, um, many of today's ethics in computing or ethics in AI is built on a secular and empiricist philosophy that is not aligned with the spiritual nature of ethics in many faith-based communities around the world. The second story is coming from an ongoing project by my student Muhammad Rifat Rashid Jaman, who has been studying the use of social media by the faith-based communities in Bangladesh, especially the practicing Muslims there. In this project, we have been studying why many practicing Muslims were not using modern online social media like Facebook. So this is what Rifat wrote in his field note in February 2020. In our field work, we found religious Muslim people were not using Facebook. We asked them why. One of them explained they do not like the AI algorithm of Facebook. 
we wanted to know more. He said, it is very unpredictable for him. He does not know what will come next to his new street. What if he ends up seeing or reading something that he is not supposed to do? This uncertainty make him avoid using Facebook or any other social media. So now, as we can see, many members of this practicing Muslim community are not comfortable with the uncertainty of what can come to their newsfeed. We note again that such ethical concerns are often not discussed in the Western discourse around ethics in AI or ethics in computing. These and many other stories from our fieldwork and a rich body of work in political philosophy, anthropology, social sciences, and theology help us understand why the idea of a generalized and ubiquitous ethics is both wrong and problematic. More importantly, taking an ethical standard from one context and applying that on another context is a classical mechanism of silencing people. This kind of imposition of foreign ethics was a common tendency in colonial period as evidence in the history. As a result, many knowledges and practices of the people of the colonized lands were called illegitimate, unethical, or substandard. This is why a turn to the idea of justification that underpins the voice of marginalized population is important. Building on the definition of justice given by Nobel laureate Indian economist and philosopher Amartya Sen, we define justification both as an instrumental and constitutive mechanism that validates one action based on their social and communal rights and their reason for achieving freedom. So now we ask, how can we design to be just for a traditional community? In the rest of my presentation, I will describe three stories from our ongoing project in rural Bangladesh to highlight three important aspects of ethical design with the local communities, which are often missing the design of computing system, uh, missing in the, in the traditional computing systems, uh, especially in AI systems. Three, these three aspects are ecology, identity, and hope. This project is being led by my collaborator, Sharifa Sultana, who was born and raised in Jashor and Bangladesh, where the field site is. She is currently a PhD student at the Information Science Department of Cornell University and also a Facebook fellow. The last three years, we have been studying how people in six villages in rural Jashor, which is a district in Southwest Bangladesh, interact with modern science and computer technologies and how those impact their well-being practices. In the three years, we have documented more than 50 cases of witchcraft, production of more than 25 kinds of local art and the local practices of betting and gambling. During this time, we conducted more than 300 interviews, more than 20 focus group discussions and taken more than 1000 photographs. At the same time, we also conducted more than 10 sessions of participatory design with the villagers for solving local problems. We have been working with the support of local NGOs, political leaders, local police and others. And some of the findings of um, our ongoing study has already been published in three of our recent publications in CHI and CSCW. So if you are interested to know more about our work, I would recommend you read the full versions of these papers. So let us first check some of the basic information about the six villages that we studied. 80% of the population uh, in those villages are Muslims, around 19% were Hindus, and the rest are either Buddhist or Christians. 65% of the local population is engaged in farming. So Jashore is famous for producing rice, cotton, lentils, and jute. Around 20% of the villagers are fishermen, and the rest are engaged in various other um, professions, including pottery, weaving, and other small businesses. The average monthly income for the for a family is 5,000 Bangladeshi taka, which is equivalent to 59 US dollars. Various recent reports show that these villages are increasingly suffering from landlessness, poverty, crimes, and migration to cities. Over the uh, course of our field work, we explored the villagers' dependency on witchcraft for their well-being. We found that they consult the witches for various troubles, which broadly include legal problems, natural disasters, family and financial crisis, and health problems. Furthermore, mental health patients are almost always treated by the witches in those villages. We found several reasons that influence the villagers to choose witchcraft over other means of support. First, the villagers mentioned that for hundreds of years, their ancestors held witchcraft in high regard for spiritual well-being. We heard 
of frightening stories of the local means where various strange and extra human entities known as gene, food, evil spirits, etc., attempt to harm mankind by taking control over their minds. Fears of supernatural entities were found to be widespread among the villagers and connected to their respective religious faith. A number of villagers shared similar stories from elders that, bad, that, that had been passed down for generations. They mentioned that these entities are often blamed for mis misfortunes, troubles, and accidents. And witches are believed to be the superior to normal human beings in sensing and analyzing this context and considered to be only people capable of helping. The villagers also shared their concerns regarding the limitations of scientific medical practices for challenging this spiritual situation. They believe that the doctors or the medical counselors cured the physical or physiological problems on a surface level, but failed to deal with the underlying causes. Witches, on the other hand, are more trusted than educated professionals because they gain deeper understanding of the context using, using a spiritual lens, emphasizing prevention uh, in addition to treatment. Now, I give you a quick uh, overview of the typical witchcraft therapy session to help you understand how witchcraft connects health and well being with deeper moral problems of the community. So, this witch therapy starts with investigation. Regardless of their clients' problems, they often use informal conversations to gain deep insight into their particular problem. For, for instance, during our observation at one witch's place, we found one woman who came to take help. The woman mentioned that she lost her necklace. As the conversation progressed, the witch directed the discussion toward the women's family, household, and recent encounters with visitors. At one point, the witch said, I think your sister-in-law has taken it. My understanding is that this loss will lead the suspicion to the elder bride and then deteriorate the relationship, which will benefit the sister-in-law the most. As this conversation progressed, the witch suggested activities that would improve the relationship between the two brides. The witch concluded with the message that even if the necklace does not come back to the woman, she will get something much more precious, which is mental peace. As we can see here, the solution of the loss of necklace was not limited to getting back the necklace, but it addressed the problem of jealousy between the brides. Next, the second step of witchcraft is explanation and prediction. In this step, the witches explain the cause of a misfortune by connecting them to supernatural powers. Drawing upon their own explanations, the witches also make predictions. In this step, the witch explains why some misfortune happened to the client. Most often than not, the reason is anger of the god, which occurred because some immoral activities either conducted by their client or their relatives. In the fourth step of the witchcraft, the witches connect their own explanation to the traditional uh, religions using some complex formula. This is important for the witchcraft not to go against the existing beliefs and maintain a harmony with the community. Here, we remind you that the most popular traditional beliefs in our field was Islam and Hinduism. As a result, there were two major tracks of witchcraft prescriptions in this step. One was Allah Kalam, which was connected to Islam, and the second one was Kali Mantra, which was connected to Hindu religion. And in the final step, the witches give the client material products to use and tell them the rules of how to use them. The Isa solutions are Dua or Mantra or Tabis or Kriya. So it is important to note that these materials are local and they contain texts from traditional religions, although using them in a way that was not advised by those religions. This is in fact a very clear demonstration of how the witches embed the religious ethics in the environment and the society. Here the role of the witchcraft is not to challenge the modern medical science, nor the religion, but to work with both of them. Their main role is to tie them together in a way that the villagers' moral commitment to the environment and the society becomes stronger. Thus, witchcraft practices take the problem from its modern scientific formulation to a spiritual level, where they embed a problem in the society and finds its root in morality. In these villages, which are considered intelligent people, and, and as we can see, their intelligence is rooted in holding the ethics of the community by attaching the villagers to their environment and society. So at the same time, the witches also utilize their power to fight various social norms, including misogyny, radical religious rules, health-related stigmas, and taboos. 
For example, we noted at least seven cases where the witches acting as the marriage counselors engaged in female uh, female members of the union councils and the police to save female clients from their in-laws who had tortured and starved them, demanded dowry, etc. These incidents highlight how witches justify their work by local value system and in parallel work toward the freedom of the villagers. We find this aligned with the definition of justice that Amartya Sen was, has given in his work. So now, if we reflect on this, um, on this particular study, we see that the rural understanding of intelligence is different from what we often think as intelligence in the modern scientific world. Intelligence is rooted in holding the ethical base of a society and serving the community and nature according to this rural belief. And ethics in a society goes beyond individual benefit and the focus is always on the ecological understanding of well-being. Next, we turn to another important aspect of rural ethics in Bangladesh that sets it apart from some common practices of data and visualization in computer science and AI. We focus on the visual art practices in rural Bangladesh, and through this, we show, we show how the ethics in handling data is different in rural Bangladesh from that in Western scientific communities. In modern visualization practice, the meaning of a data that is encoded in the presentation is not affected by the medium. For example, in the images on the right side of the slide, we see snapshot of a, uh, of a institutions funding, research, training, and clinical services in, in 2018. On the top one, the user is watching the publicly available electronic copy of the report opened in their browser. In the bottom one, another user is watching the same portion of the report on their mobile phone, and both of the users are expected to arrive at a similar understanding of the information. Here, we would like to note that two characteristics of modern data visualization practices. One, Data is not connected to any particular material, and data is not connected to the people who created the data. Hence, the practice of data collection and visualization does not have the ethical accountability to the people who are affected by them. This is where the traditional data visualization practices are different. Here, we will focus on two kinds of visual art practices in rural Bangladesh to explain these differences. First, the design of Nakshikatha. This is a type of embroidered quilt. Nakshikata is a centuries-old tradition in Bengal region. The basic materials used are thread and old cloth. The colorful patterns and designs that are embroidered resulted in the name of Nakshikata, which was derived from the Bengali word Naksha, which refers to artistic patterns. The early katas had white background accented with red, blue, black embroidery, later yellow, green, pink, and other colors also included. Nakshikatha often comes with the theme. Such theme includes mythological stories, renowned local history, uh, and religious events. The types of stitches, motifs, and ceiling of the border of the Nakshikatha have very situated meanings. The meaning and the interpretation of these motifs might change depending on where it was designed. And the second form of visual art that we studied was Hindu idols or Murti. It is a general term for an image, a statue or idol of a deity or mortal Hindu culture. In Hindu temples, it is a symbolic icon. A murti is itself not a god in Hinduism, but it is a shape embodiment and manifestation of a deity. So uh, the a murti is typically made by uh, carving stone, woodworking, metal casting, or through pottery. Ancient era takes describing their proper portions and all these positions and gestures. And in the religious context, they are found you know, in Hindu temples or in, in different festivals. So making idols is a strictly caste-based profession. Ideally, the Pal families practice this craftsmanship and generally train their male children for years at home and at local local Thakurai Karigors. So now in we will highlight some of the distinct features of these two forms of visual art in rural Bangladesh that will distinguish them from modern data visualization practices. So first of all is this abstraction. One key element of the communicating data in modern science, both digitally and in analog form, is the use of abstract marks like points, lines, bars, curves, or squares. In some cases, single marks can represent collections or even entire data set. For example, a sim single bar can represent the number of people 
amount of annual income or the frequency of rains in different graphs. However, that is really the case for rural visualization practice. The visual designers we have studied used representation that were as close as possible to the meaning that they intended to convey, avoiding a high level of abstraction. For example, Goddess Lakshmi, there is a lot full of wealth. Generally, the idol makers portray a pot of money to show that. When you ask them if it is if it possible to replace that pot of money with another mundane object and convey the same message, which could be paper money or you know like a bank check, for example. Maker in our focus group discussion laughed at the idea and explained the pot is not only about the money or cash flow, it's about the wealth that will come and sustain, like the way the pot holds the wealth in it, ensuring the sustainability. Bank checks might just fly out, right? So that's the materiality uh, and the concreteness of the data is very important there. The second point is the storyteller's provenance. Digital media often focuses on the scalability and reproducibility Thus, the convention that are almost uh, uh, universal among users' digital systems. This is why for a modern visualization practice, it is often unimportant to know about the artist and their perspective. The artist often has very little to say, and in some cases, making the artist invisible means a better visualization. However, this is not true in rural visualization practices in Bangladesh, where it is very important to know about the artist and their perspective to understand visual art. For example, the Nakshikatha that we can see here now uh, contains a year's worth of significant events as explained by a housewife. The participant informed us that the year would look different in someone else's Nakshikatha since the relative significance of the event's shape and the size of the object and design sensibility would vary person from person to person. She said, my great grandmother mapped all the significant events that happened that year. My cousin has another one that has made by great grandmother's sister-in-law who lived in the same house. That one had a Bull, had a bull and circus on it, you know, everyone's ear is different and their choice of motives are also different. You might need to ask and verify what it is about. This rural visualization practices and data cannot be separated from the story and the story cannot be separated from the storyteller. So in summary, the, in rural Bangladesh, working with data makes one accountable to their history and culture nature and community and their faith. Data cannot be separated from the materials and social context. Also, data should be understood through the lens of the storyteller. Thus, the, for the rural people in Bangladesh, ethics in data is embedded in holding their communal identity and moral values, and it is deeply situated in local material culture. Finally, we turn to the question of hope and luck, and for this, we investigate the betting and gambling practices in rural Bangladesh. So sports betting is an activity of predicting sports results and placing a wager on, uh, on, on, on the outcome. In rural Bangladesh, it is very common for the villagers to betting on the sports like cricket and football. In modern scientific world, the statistics is widely used to make prediction games. And uh, we uh, and people often use different software for certain predictions. Um, in rural Bangladesh, we also saw that villagers were using different prediction software to see which team is uh, predicted to win. However, we found that their final decision was often different from what the software was suggesting. This is where we found a clear difference between uh, the statistical probability as we understand in scientific practices and what they mean by the hope. So there are different kinds of betting practices we found in the in the field. Uh, Cogiting one is which one is more outdoor one played by men, and the dharna was uh, uh, was also an outdoor one, but it was also mediated by some other person. And the gare is an indoor betting practices. In all forms of betting, we found that the villages relied less on the statistical probability. Their decision was mostly made by the cultural values that they hold. For example, they often label some people as inauspicious or kufa in local language, and their decision would often depend on the decision of those inauspicious people, meaning that they would always bet the opposite to what that people bet. For example, in this code, you see that they, this on this inauspicious people, they were trying to find out what they would be betting for, and they would go exactly opposite to that. Besides such superstitions, we also found that the decision was also shaped by their religious or national identities. 
This was evident when there was a cricket match between Pakistan and India. Since Pakistan was a Muslim majority country, we found that most Muslim villagers in the in in in, in those in our field they were betting for Pakistan. Although the software was saying that India was going to win, we saw similarly that you know when there was a match against Bangladesh where Bangladesh was playing. Although the software was saying that Bangladesh was going to lose, they were supporting Bangladesh. I want to highlight here that their betting decisions were not only coming from an ethical obligation to their country, religion, or culture, but they really believed that their faith would make the supported team win. So here, their prediction of future was not shaped by the past data, but a hope for the future that is shaped by the ethical standpoint. Next, we would also do different kinds of they would also do different kinds of calculations for predicting the win that are different from what we do in the statistical software. For example, if some of them failed in three consecutive cases while betting for a team that they are ethically right to support, they believe that they are surely going to win the fourth time. And it is important to note that this is very much different from what we do in modern machine learning and scientific practices. If 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 consecutive three or four times our algorithm gives us a wrong result, we easily change the algorithm or we take a different decision. But for them the more they fail, the closer they think they are at, they are from the winning. So as we can see, there are fundamental differences between the Western notion of hope and rural traditional understanding of hope in Bangladesh. Hope in rural Bangladesh is not created by past data or empirical evidence, but from an ethical standpoint. Uh, secondly, modern scientific data-driven models seldom involve cultural values that are hard to quantify. They function poorly in Global South, uh, where the ethics of hope here relies on luck, which is hard to calculate using any statistical mechanism. This is where faith and ethics become uh, important here. So what is intelligence? As we can see, intelligence in traditional Bangladeshi community is defined by ethics, ecology, communal values, hope, and identity. The set of qualities is quite different from the modern Western definition of intelligence, which uh, stands on scientific rationality, generalizability, and probability. So ethics is not a kind of intelligence in traditional Bangladesh, but ethics is an essential element of any intelligence there. So we come back to the question of whose ethics. Now, well, let's go back to the original question of, of voice. As we could see in our project that this witchcraft and modern scientific approaches are not universally practiced and appreciated. In today's world, while the majority of the Western world appreciates the modern scientific understanding of health and well-being, for example, many other places in the world, they have different other perspectives. Traditional healing, witchcraft, sorcery, and local practices are still prevalent in those places in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Millions of people um, in those places depend on those faith-based practices, and we cannot just impose our ethical understanding on them. And this particular issue is also connected to the colonial history of science and technology. For example, across the history of the colonization uh, and cultural imperialism, traditional medical practices were ignored and sidelined. And now, uh, as computers, computing devices have become ubiquitous, many HSA researchers are now taking the advantages of computing to spread this their ethical understanding of well-being uh, to the people who, who are coming from a different ethical perspectives. And this is where we find it problematic. We also saw in the creation, collection, and use of data, uh, we have a strong ethical implication in the traditional societies, and they cannot be thought without considering the history and identity of the people of those communities. So our study on traditional data visualization practices show how the rural Bangladeshi communities have a long and rich tradition of storytelling and communicating information that is strongly connected to the local art, culture, people, and history. And we cannot separate that from an abstract level data representation, which is often practiced in the Western world. And finally, intelligence is being hopeful. Our study on betting practices show that there are fundamental differences between the Western notion of rationality and the rural traditional rationality in Bangladesh. Uh, in many cases, the Western society is individualist and secular. The good is often defined by personal and individual benefit. Also, the traditional concept of luck is different from probability as defined in the literature of data science and data-driven decision-making. 
while there is a trend in AI machine learning and smart technology supported world to quantify and predict the future, for many people living in the traditional societies in the global south, future largely depends on their luck and luck is controlled by the God. So being ethical is the way to become successful in future, not counting your past. So we argue that to sustain the voice of local communities in non-Western societies, the current models of AI are not sufficient. The discussion of ethics in AI should not only center on the Western notion of ethics. We should get rid of a universal and generalized form of intelligence and localized and situated ethical practices should consider local faith best practices, local stories and local hopes. So in order to have the voice of the marginalized groups uh, in, over, in and over computing platforms, we need to make sure that they have easy and equal access to computing. They have the necessary autonomy and freedom to express their rightful concerns, and their voice is not suppressed by imposing a foreign standard of ethics. Building on my framework of voice, my team and I are now working on a few projects to support and strengthen the voice of marginalized communities. Definitely ethics and AI in the global south is one of the main projects that we're working on. And these are the questions that we are asking, which uh, I explained briefly. Uh, and then uh, we are also uh, taking this to understand what it means by safe computing. Here we are asking what is the privacy and security from the global South perspective? How can we you know, address the problems of sexual harassment, misinformation, and uh, uh, environmental justice uh, if we consider the situated ethics of the global South? And we're still uh, building on the idea of participatory design and adversarial learning in those projects. So um, as I'm working on these projects, I want to thank all the funding agencies and institutions for supporting uh, for our work. And they include NSARC, CIHR, Shark, NIH, Google, Microsoft Research, Samsung, Toronto, Cornell University. And I also want to thank all my colleagues and collaborators who have been helping me advise this, uh, this project forward. Um, here are the names of only a few of them, and definitely I want to thank my wonderful research group, Hardespace at University of Toronto. So thank you all for patiently hearing my talk. I uh, would be delighted to hear your feedback, comments, and questions. Also, please feel free to reach out to me at this email address if you have more thoughts to share with me. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for sharing the talk with us. So I will kick one off and then <clears throat> we can go from there. So I, I hear a tension in your, um, in your presentation between trying to avoid colonial impulses with, with our ethics, um, but also uh, dealing with cultural relativism, right? Where there's, if you completely let go of any sort of notion of universal human rights, then you're also going to be dealing with you, know, you you yourself called out behaviors that were, for example, harmful to women, right? Which may be totally reasonable within the the local community's ethical framework, but one that it, it, at least my sense was implicit you, implicitly you were critiquing. So I wanted to sort of draw that tension out and and ask you how you recommend we navigate it, both at a sort of a high level and maybe specifically within one of the projects you want to do. How how are you going to deal with that? Yeah, no, that's a, that's, a, that's a fascinating question. That's, that's actually a very important question. And the answer is actually very context specific. There is no like a universal answer to this question. So there are a couple of things that we uh, need to understand here is that there, there, there are definitely some universal um, idea of uh, what is good and what is bad. And there are like a levels that uh, we try to maintain in the, in the societies. But we also uh, believe that these uh, communities, the traditional communities where these uh, ethical standards emerge from, they also have their own way of protect this uh, these rights. So, uh, and in in different traditional communities, if we really believe that uh, there needs to be a social change, the social change should come from within. So we need to work with them. It's not like we impose our ethics uh, uh, on them. So um, I, I can give you one example, especially with this um, uh, with this uh, questions of uh, women's freedom. So we have been working with uh, um, Muslim Islamic feminists for the last couple of years. So who are still working with this uh, with the empowerment of women, but being within this Islamic framework? So you do not fight against Islam for making this, you know, for helping them to get empowerment. And there are wonderful examples of. Muslim women who actually have done that. 
And so uh, we want to work with them to bring those changes in their communities. So it's, I guess, like more of a process question uh, uh, in that, like how we work with the community. And each of these communities, they have their, definitely these are not monolithic communities. They also have internal tensions. So there we have this opportunity to work with the, the, the marginalized voice within the community. For example, women are often silenced in, in, in many traditional religious communities. So why don't we work with them and move it forward? But as I said, it's, a, it's a, a not all, I mean, it's, it's very hard to universalize this thing. It's very context specific. Thanks panelists. This is a good moment if you, any of you would like to jump in. This talk was fascinating to me. I, I learned a lot. Um, there's so much um, to, to study and learn about cultures like this. I'm wondering about, um, since um, this is a heterogeneous society that you talked about with um, Muslims, Hindus, and um, miscellaneous others, um, how much do they mix? How, how much do they respect each other? And I'm sort of wondering if technology can be one of those others that kind of mix in, like um, if there are indigenous visualizations that they understand, but um, um, you know, a computer thing gives them this different visualization. Can they understand it sort of the way they understand those weirdo Hindus over there or something like that? No, that that's like a, like a really great question. So now, uh, you know, if we uh, look at the history of these religions in these communities, we found that uh, like uh, Islam also came a few hundred years ago to these communities. Like Hinduism probably came a few, you know, like a, like 1000 years ago there so these were like the some um, traditional communities they learned this um, this religion and religious practices but they have like very strong cultural practices which they consider their identity so religion is kind of like a, a top of thing on the top of that but beneath that they are they consider themselves equal and which is very important because when we were starting this um, witchcraft and the witches they were focusing on that. They were saying that, yes, you can practice, uh, you know, your Islam or Hinduism, whatever religion that you practice, but your community bonds, mutual respect, these are more important. So they were then coming up with interpretations of how, you know, if, if they find that some, uh, some version, some interpretation of a religious text is, uh, is, you know, driving them against one another, they were coming up with, a, with an uh, interpretation that kind of negotiates them. So the role of the witches, and that's the intelligence that they say, is to find the deeper meaning. And the deeper meaning is that you don't fight with each other, essentially. So they are, so there's the um, like a high level moral, uh, I mean, um, uh, task that they, you know, that the service that they give to the community. They, so that they become respectful to each other, they become respectful to environment, the nature, the animals, so they try to hold them together and anything which is coming externally, they kind of try to resist there. So for that, what we found like technology in itself is, uh, they don't take that as a, as a problematic thing, which I know like in, in many uh, scholars, they say like, well, you know, we don't believe. So they don't have, you know, uh, any problem, let's say for uh, in terms of technology, they're using mobile phones, computers, and, you know, like uh, uh, televisions, what they, do not like is when uh, these technologies tell them what is good and what is bad, what they need to do. So they uh, they kind of like lose their authority. So an NGO person comes and they you know use this machine and they are telling you that tomorrow it will rain. Now you do this. They don't like that. They say, well, our God knows, and you cannot take that away from us. So it's a it's a there that the tension is there. It's not like you know the technology itself. So the values that the authority that technology brings with it, and which kind of like comes from an idea. Even if you were in the field, you'll understand that you know the scientists go there in a from a level. They say, "Well, we understand this because we are soil scientists. We know how soil works." And they say, "We have been, you know, uh, doing agriculture in this land for thousands of years. What are you doing?" So that is the tension that you know uh, we we found more problematic there. 
So Ishtahik, wonderful talk. Absolutely. I'm with Terry on that. I just, wow. I just, I said to my husband early on, I love this guy. So um, I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit more about this um, experience where the NGO basically created something that wasn't wanted or you couldn't, didn't fit into the culture. And do you feel like had they done a better job of truly understanding Right. they would not have done that or what 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 do you think it's a good question and susan i know like you you know about the situation there most of these ngos are actually funded by foreign you know like money and this um the funders often want a scientific and data and you know like results and report so i i won't blame the ngos uh much though if you don't put ai and machine learning in your proposal even for the ngos it's very hard to get you know i'm i'm Saying the truth. So we also understand that many of these NGO people, they are local people. They know that even going there, they, they are telling us, you talk to them and they will not like it. But why are you doing this? Well, they, that's, that's, you know, they, they need money. So it's not that they don't understand this, but um, uh, you know, it's the, also the age of NGOization in that part of the world. NGO is also a way they earn money. Uh, but I think uh, if we, kind of like create a bit of like a local voice and resistance uh, against it, then that will be, you know, helpful. It's not against machine learning. It's a very wrong, that very wrong interpretation. They are not against the technology, but don't take it away from the local people. They are also into how can we help the local leaders so that they can hold this be the right way to go. Right, um, right. So can you, uh, sorry to follow up though. Do you have any suggestions as to how we can get that mentality into the, funders minds so they kind of get it and they understand it right. or is so, that a losing battle <laughs> no, no no so here is here is one um here here is uh, one thing that we are working on a lot of times even you know in the in this machine learning world when you will find the biased output you will hear people saying this problem is with the data because there wasn't enough data or the data was mislabeled and it comes from an understanding that well if we had a lot of data from those people that would be, you know, like uh, the scenario would be changed. But the problem is that the history in that part of the world, you, the scientific, the science people do not take that, even in the, his, the methods of history, because those histories are, you know, like oral history or they're in the, in, you know, in, in some part of that is kind of like a mythological. There is a way how you understand or interpret me that is not taken seriously in data science because data science is more, you know, like a very serious one. So if we can establish the, their history and their ethics as a, you know, a strong point, then we can we can put that before these funders, saying that well, they, what they're saying is also coming from an evidence. You cannot just throw it away. It's you know, when they say, uh, you know, a devil will come, it's probably not a devil. We need to understand what they are talking about. And if we take this seriously, you understand that they are actually, you know, talking about something which actually happened in that land and which is important before you design something for that. So that is uh, something we're trying to uh, now work on how we can make a voice out of this uh, data, which now scientists do not take seriously. And can that be a way of, um, raising their voice. So it, it's now being done in both ways. We are also working with the local, um, uh, you know, like youth groups for, uh, for you know, like uh, teaching uh, this to the, to, the, to, the, to the NGO workers or others who are coming in. And also with the, with, the, with the people who are kind of like trying to help them from our side to learn this, this culture. I think it's both of these are important. I'd love to close with a student question. Based on uh, your research, what concretely do you think that the big tech companies like Facebook should do so that they can be more catered toward you know, local populations? It's, uh, okay, so this is a good question, and this is also a hard question for me to answer. Um, but I think if uh, one good thing that I, I liked about Facebook is their idea of making connections. And I think that is also that, that, that is one thing that we also found that the the traditional people they value. But the connection has to be meaningful connection. 
So I think if Facebook really, you know, like um, wants to to focus on their idea, their philosophy of connection, they need to work with these people and try to understand who they want to get connected to and what kind of message they want to, uh, you know, like spread or want to tell other people their stories. So it may come from uh, the modalities of the information and uh, the the way uh, they are treated in the in the community right now what we are seeing is that when traditional people in the traditional communities when they talk in the uh, in the you know like a public forum they are often mocked ridiculed and they are challenged like where is your evidence you know we have created a digital space which is sanitized from all kind of you know like a faith you you cannot talk about that it has to be very data driven and you know, like a, this uh, imperative way of talking about this, and that is silencing them. So Facebook might want to create a space, like for Facebook or these big companies that are respectful to um, their, you know, like designed within their, uh, with their values. All right, let's close it here. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, uh -huh. We will see you all soon. I'm, I'm, some of the folks in the group will have a, have a chance to chat with you earlier today or later today. Uh, thanks for for ending our seminar for the quarter. We're 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 very grateful that you that you joined us. We'll see you all soon.